Well, it is nearing the end of, of the summer here, and we're just trying to do as much as we can to enjoy summer. So, like yesterday, Erica and I and the kids went to Big Woods Lake, and we walked around, and there's just so much to notice there. Now, my kids were playing Pokemon Go, so they're not really into the natural world like they could be, but we made them turn it off halfway through our walk around the lake and look around. And just the few observations that you can make about the natural world, it is amazing. And the question asks, we ask is, what do we see when we see nature? What do we see when we look at the many different worlds, animal, plant worlds that we see? What do we see? Um, you take a, somebody like Albert Einstein, and when he looked at the world, you know, he could not claim to be an atheist. He wasn't a pantheist. We're not exactly sure what he believed, but he sensed that there was something behind all of creation. And it moved him to be in awe of it. What do we see when we look at nature? Well, we're going to look at that question answered in Psalm 19. So I invite you to turn to Psalm 19 this morning. This psalm is it's attributed to David. Uh, it's in the first book of the psalms. There's five books in the psalms. The first 41 psalms are in book one. 38 of those 41 psalms are written by David. David is the king. He's King David. He was the second king over Israel. And he ruled somewhere around 1000 BC. And he was considered to be a man after God's own heart. And we've looked at different psalms this summer. We looked at a praise psalm. We looked at lament. We looked at wisdom last week and penitential. And this is what they call a Torah psalm. It means it's about the word of God. Torah means uh, instruction or direction or teaching. And it really covers all of God's revelation to us. Not just the first five books of the Bible. All of it. Torah means all of it. Psalms 1 and 19 and 119 are all Torah psalms. Psalm 1 talks about the success of God's word. Those who follow God's word are like a tree planted by streams of water. And all they do succeeds. Psalm 119, if you've heard of it, is the longest chapter in the Bible. 176 verses praising the Word of God. Psalm 19, though, is a unique jewel. It is, as C.S. Lewis said, he said, I take this to be the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. I invite you to sit back and listen to the first half of this psalm as a band called the Sons of Korah interprets the first half of Psalm 19 musically. Let's listen in. <laughs> Oh, uh -huh. 
starting at verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from, innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is God's word. It speaks much for itself. And there is a second half of that video. I didn't play the second song by the sons of Korah. They do the second half as well. There are a few ways God speaks in this passage. The first way is through nature. And we call this, in theological terms, they call this general revelation. That's, that's the term used for how God speaks to everyone through nature. The psalmist sees it in particular in the skies in this passage. He sees the heavens declaring the glory of God. Now God could have created a really drab gray universe, but he didn't. It's glorious. By doing that, he spoke something. He spoke something about himself. He spoke about how he himself is glorious. You know, Eric and I, uh, this week, we, went, we had a date night, and we went, uh, we were coming back from dinner, and Erica noticed that the sky was nice and pink, and there was, so we decided to chase a sunset. <laughs> and we drove around town, and we, we went west of, uh, you and I, to a small road, and we just, off on a side road, just watched the sunset, just watched with awe. This, like the sky was like an easel with pink and blues and clouds, and it was, it was great. You know, naturalists, they can look at something like that, and they can explain the how. They can explain how light reflects off of a sky, and how we get certain colors because of the angle of the sun and the Earth's atmosphere. Um, you, can, you can look at the weather patterns and figure out what, why the clouds are the way they are at a particular moment. You know, and a naturalist can look and they can understand how certain neurons trigger in our mind when we see things and it creates this feeling that we feel something with beautiful. They, the how questions are, are they're interesting, but they don't answer the why question at least not really in a way that satisfies our experience. Why would such beauty exist? Why do a million trillion stars hang above us that cause us to write love songs? Why is there so much beauty in the world? The psalmist says it is there to declare the glory of God. The glory of God. What, well, what is that message? Well, it is at once saying God is amazing. If you think the sunset is amazing, wait till you see the one who made it. But glory, that word kabod in Hebrew, has a weightiness to it. God is weighty. He is, in fact, he is more weighty than the entire cosmos. If you think the cosmos is amazing, wait till you see God. Just like the sky can make us feel small, God's glory is so great, we can't fathom his greatness. The message is the glory of God. What does the poem say? Well, it says, it goes on to talk about how frequently God is speaking through it. How often is nature speaking? All the time. Day and night it pours forth knowledge. At any moment you could angle, you could measure the angles of stars and galaxies and orbits of planets, the orientation of the galaxies with respect to the earth. You could measure weather data. 
There's no shortage of knowledge coming out of the sky. And we can't even measure it all. Nature constantly speaks of the glory of God. Not only is it constant speech, it is a universal language. Now, this week I, I learned about a new superpower. And it is called the omnilinguist. If you are an omnilinguist, it means that you can understand any language, you can speak any language. And that's what nature is. It at least speaks omnilinguistically. There, it speaks to every language. There's no language where you can't understand how great nature is and whoever made it. Romans 1.20 says that God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they, meaning everyone, is without excuse. Everybody has seen how great creation is. Therefore, nobody is without excuse to acknowledge whoever or whatever created God. Nature points to the glory of God in every language. Not only is it in every language, it speaks everywhere on earth, to the ends of the earth. It's omnipresent in that way. It speaks everywhere. Now the psalmist switches gears a little bit. He starts with a, using a couple of metaphors. Uh, in ancient times, uh, people would describe, he, he describes the sun going from one end to the other. And in ancient times, a bridegroom would, you know, they lived in tents and he would leave the tent and go to his bride's house to claim his wife. I don't know if this is how it was, Jeff and Amanda. Jeff, when he got married, he proudly walked all the way to the Stout's house <laughs> to get his bride. Yeah, probably not. But it was a picture of confidence and glory. You know, modern weddings often proclaim the glory of the bride. You know, that's the center of the attention. But in this case, it's the groom. And the groom is confident. And the groom is a man of rock-solid character moving to take his bride. If that's what the sunrise looks like, the psalmist switches metaphors now and he compares the sun to an athlete, a champion running a strong and steady course to to the finish line of his course. Now, you know, a marathon, it takes, you know, anywhere from three to five hours. Well, the sun is running from eight to 12 hours a day from one side to the other. It's more than a marathon. Now, we know that the sun itself isn't actually moving. We, we know that the earth is the one rotating. But from an ancient perspective and from anybody's perspective, not knowing that, it is what it looks like the sun is doing. And frankly, poetically, as this is a poem, it makes sense to use this metaphor as what the sun is doing. He's a champion running across the sky. Uh, so the sun has now become the main character in this poem. And it says about him, there is nothing hidden from its heat. Nothing. The sun is inescapable, you might say. Now, yes, we can hide under houses, and they had these things there, but imagine desert, and imagine camping. Has anybody gone camping this summer? Campers, couple people, three adventuresome campers, we're going next weekend. Tents, when you're in a tent, you just long for some kind of tree, because it gets hot, and you need shade. Wherever you go, the sun is, it beats down. And there's no escaping the sun. So we have here the first half of this poem. We have general revelation. It's about God and his glory. We see he is powerful. He is incredibly beautiful. He can speak every language. He speaks all the time, everywhere. And you know, we do well to listen and learn from God's creation. To pay attention to what God has done. And learn about God from creation. You know, just as we're thinking about nature here, this poem takes a shift. It turns right. It takes like a completely different turn. It starts talking about God's word. You know, when I first read this, I was, I was kind of confused. I thought, well, how, what's the tie in here? But to a Jewish person who had grown up knowing Torah, it was as natural as anything. It's about God's word. It's about what they call in theological terms, special revelation. 
It's special because it goes into detail about God and about his works and about his character. It's what we cannot know from nature. It takes the form of a covenant that God makes with people, with Abraham's people. Now, we can learn things from creation. We know many things from creation, but we also don't know many things because creation is cursed. So, for example, we can learn about God's power easily. We can even learn something about God's love because we can see a robin with its young in its nest, nurturing its young. But what do we make of, like, the bear killing a deer? Or, like, a hurricane? What do you make of that? Or mosquitoes? What do we learn about God from mosquitoes? Well, for these questions, we need more information, and God's given it in special revelation through his word. So, verses 7 through 11, God, David here uses six different forms of God's word, six, six different terms. First, he uses the word Torah, the law of the Lord. The Torah of the Lord is perfect. God's full instruction, his direction, it's all, it, it's perfect. It's hard for us to imagine speaking perfectly, right? Without flaw. But God does. He has. And it revives the soul. That's the benefit that it gives. It revives the soul. Literally, it means returns life to the soul. Does your soul seem dull and lifeless? Then read God's word. It will return life to you. When you hear it, you understand it, it will return life to you. Secondly, he says, the testimony of the Lord. Well, a testimony is a little different. It is, it, is, it is the sure story about what God has said is true about himself, especially. It's true about history. It's sure. It's good testimony. When God says his name on the mountain, he says, I am the Lord, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger. That's who God is. That's what God is like. Now, what's the benefit we get from this testimony? Well, it says it makes... Simple people wise. Now, simple people, that's not just Forrest Gump. But it's simple as in any of us need wisdom. Any of us who can be led astray by different ideas. We all need that wisdom. And the God, word of God is the sure source. The third and the fourth word that he uses here. He uses precepts and commandments. And these words are similar. At first, when I thought of precepts, I thought, oh, that's just like a proposition or an idea. And it's, but it's not. It's... Picadim in Hebrew. Precept is very similar to a command. It is a command. It is, it is what the, we are responsible before God to do. And commandments, you know what those are. They're what we're supposed to do. They show that God has the authority to command and give us precepts. And these are perfect. They're perfect, like silver refined in a furnace. Seven times God spoke them. And they were perfect. Well, you might say, why would anybody love commandments? Think about what commandments do. They bring order and peace and stability in society. You know, we live in an age where everyone's an authority all of a sudden. And everybody's as great as anybody else. What do we, and we get millions of opinions, millions of opinions, if we wanted to listen to them all. Compare that to the commandments of the Lord where a single wise authority directs us. Ah, what a relief. We know what to believe. It brings joy and true enlightenment. Fourth, the, fo the fear of the Lord is clean, it says, and enduring forever. Now, the fear of the Lord, that doesn't sound like a term for for the Word of God. And, and it, is, it is more of like the attitude that we approach the Word of God with. We have to have respect for the Word of God. You know, as, as a Bible teacher, uh, as Bi we have many teachers here, we have to teach the Word of God as though we need to fear what God says. It's part of the teaching of the Bible itself. We must fear the Lord and listen to His Word. And it says that this is an enduring thing and it is a maturing thing for us to fear the Lord. It's clean as opposed to dirty or decaying. If we listen to the God's word, it is, will preserve us. It is clean. And the final word, God's word, is that, it, that his rules are true and righteous. His rules, which that word rules could be, could be judgment as well. 
And you know what? There's no real benefit described here. It's more just the reality of how it is. It is though God is in a courtroom and he has declared to us what is just and right and he will make judgments based on those declarations. And they're completely right. God will always end up on the right side of history because he is righteous and he will make judgments that are right. So after hearing about this word, all the benefits it has, what does David think about the word after he describes it? He says he wants it more than gold, more than fine gold. Do you want to get rich? Well, the word of God is better. We should want it more than money. Well, why don't we want the word of God more than money? Well, the world creeps in and we start to think that things are better than what God has told us. But wisdom from God is worth more than money. He says that it is sweeter than honey. Now, we like honey around our house. It's sweeter than honey. Now, maybe, maybe you don't uh, use honey a whole lot, but there must be some sweets that you really like. Maybe a favorite candy bar. Just, I just want to ask you this right now. Do you have a favorite candy bar that you, if you could have any candy bar, what would it be? We'll just, I'm just going to hear from a couple of you. Snickers. <laughs> Reese's peanut butter cups. Skittles. Pure sugar with Skittles, right? Yeah. Well, back in David's time, you know, they didn't have candy bars, but they had honey, and it was sweet. And David says that there is a sweeter dessert than honey. One worth craving even more than tiramisu or carrot cake or Skittles, Reese's. There's God's word is sweeter than that. There's a sweet and rich life ahead for us if we consistently choose God's word over other things. Simply put, David goes on to say that the word of God warns us, his servants, and in keeping the word of God, we are rewarded. Now you might think we're adults, we don't need rewards, now do we? That's for kids. Ah, it's not true. You don't go to work without some kind of reward. You work because something motivates you. It could be that you need money, you need health insurance, you might love what you do, but you do it for some reason. There is a reward. And God's word, if we follow it, there are rewards. Well, we've looked at the benefits of God's word. It revives our soul. It brings joy. It brings enlightenment. It is sweeter than honey. And it's better than gold. But because of this, I want to challenge you for this next year. I want to challenge you to make a renewed commitment to God's word. Last week at our leaders retreat, we, we met and we discussed what it takes to make a disciple. And there were a lot of things that were discussed. We, we discussed there were things that a new believer needs to become a disciple. An understanding of the gospel. And then there were things that everyone needed. Not only a continued understanding of the gospel, but among those things that were needed were a dedicated time of personal study in the Word of God. We need, we, some people call it a quiet time. A personal investment. Secondly, that there's a place, a community, to discuss that Word of God with others. And third, that they, we need a place to hear the authoritative word spoken. So those three things, and it, it makes sense. If you were to be studying to become uh, an engineer or whatever, you would, you would seriously invest yourself in studying engineering. You would read the textbooks. You would go to class and discuss the ideas with people. And you would find teachers. You would go to a college, the best one you could find, to study under a teacher like that. That's what you do. It's what we do to learn things. You know, so it makes sense that we would do that with God's Word as well. You know, starting September 8th, we're going to study together as a church the book of Acts. Now, there are 28 chapters in the book of Acts. It's a kind of long book. I'm a little intimidated. But it's a great book. It's the history of what the Spirit of God does in the church after Jesus ascends. It's, it's a history. We're going to learn from that book what did God do in the early times? What 
What's that going to do to shape us personally in our church? And I want to challenge you as part of your discipleship to do those three things that I described in, in becoming a disciple that we all need. Personal time, time discussing with others God's word, and listening to an authoritative word, which would be the sermon, okay? Uh, you can rely on me for sure this, in the sermon time to be speaking or presenting the Bible, but you will actually get much more out of it yourself if you study it yourself and you talk it over with somebody. My, this presentation, answer the tough questions. You will get a better meal on Sunday if you do some pre-work before Sunday. Now, I know that's hard. Oh, who wants to do homework? We're not in school. But really, you want to, you want to get as much of the honey out of God's Word as you can. So, the way we're planning to do this, at least in part, on Sundays at the 9 o'clock hour, I know that Erica and I are going to be available to lead groups through the discussion portion of the given passage. I know other teachers are discussing it with their students as well. If you want to join in us at the 9 o'clock hour to do that, you're welcome to do that there. So we want to juice the word for its maximum benefits. Next week, we're going to study Psalm 8. And what I've done for you is I've given you a sample of what it's like for you to personally study. If you look in your bulletin, you'll see this. It says pre-Sunday study for 9119. And you're like, oh, it's two sheets. There's so much work to do there. I know. I know. Welcome to school. I'm not going to collect these sheets. <laughs> but if you get in a group that is discussing God's word, yes. I would want you to bring this with so you can show that you've worked. You know, sometimes we need that accountability to see that we've done some work. And there's plenty of questions, and they are open-ended questions. So you have to think about what, what you're looking for in, these, in, this, in this passage. So I, I give you kind of a pre-challenge for next week. Come ready to preach, and uh, we'll listen to you. Just kidding. But yeah, this is, this is just something we want to try for, so that we would encourage learning at a deeper level. We know in the past, this church has been known as the church that you go to because they, they preach the Bible. People know their Bibles here. We want to continue to be that kind of place where people know their Bibles. People in the world don't know the Bible anymore. Bible illiteracy is huge today. So we want to, we want to raise the bar for ourselves a little bit. As we come to the close of this poem, we start to see a tie between the first and the second half, between the general revelation of God and the special revelation. We see David reacts with humility. Just like nobody can escape the heat of the sun, nobody can escape the heat of God's word. God's word, it penetrates deep like a double-edged sword into our hearts. When we look into God's pure revelation, no one can walk away thinking, oh, I'm perfect. <laughs> Rather, we know we don't measure up, and we're in awe of, <laughs> of who God is. Instead, David here, he asks this question. He says, who can discern our errors? Who can discern his errors? It's a rhetorical question. Who of us individually can understand our own errors on our own that we can't? We can't see our own mistakes. We can't see our own sin. We need God's law to show us what our errors are. We need an outside source. And so David asks to be declared innocent of hidden sins. Oh, hidden sins, things that he can't see. You know, the, the law, the Torah, talks about unintentional sins. He wants to be declared innocent innocent of unintentional sins. If you've committed an unintentional sin and say you were a leader in Israel, it was required that they, you would have to sacrifice a bull. If you were just an, an individual, not a leader, you were required to sacrifice a sheep or a goat. And the sin was transferred to that goat. And that, was even, that was just for a sin that you didn't even know you did. You didn't mean to do it. Now you can, you can imagine a sin that you meant to do was premeditated, the sacrifice was even greater. Think an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. <laughs> if you made somebody go blind, you, uh, an appropriate 
consequence would be for you to go blind. David asked to be restrained from committing premeditated or presumptuous sins. Presumptuous, that's a big word for being prideful or being rebellious. It's standing up to the law of God saying, I don't care, laughing at God. Instead, David says, God, keep me from doing evil on purpose. <sighs> We're all guilty of hidden sins. And some of us are guilty of intentional sins. Now, we don't, we don't sacrifice animals like in David's time. We, we have a greater sacrifice available to us. You'll see in verse 14, if you look there, David calls his Lord his Redeemer. He says, O oh Lord, my rock and my Redeemer. David knows he has a Redeemer. He has somebody to buy him back, to pay the price for his sin. Uh, the word Redeemer is used like, a, say, a slave is a person is in slavery. He needs to be redeemed out of slavery and bought back. There's a price to be paid for that slave. We are all, in fact, slaves to sin. And since all of us have hidden errors, we need a Redeemer. And that Redeemer for us would come as a descendant of David. A thousand years after David. Jesus was born to a poor Jewish virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus not only saw the glory of God in nature, <laughs> he learned the law of God. He not only believed the testimonies of, and commandments of God, he lived them, every one of them. In fact, he, when he spoke on the law as a teacher, he clarified God's law for us. And he himself was the living word. He had never unintentionally broken God's law. And he, was, he had no presumptuous sins. And yet he gave up his life on a cross to become our Redeemer. To buy us back. Like the sacrificial goat or sheep that symbolically took away sin, Jesus really took away our sin. Yeah, have you met this Redeemer yet? He wants to take your sin away today. You know, the psalmist ends with worship. He prays a simple prayer that he would find favor in God's sight, that his words and his deeds would be pleasing to God. You know, today we find that approval through Christ's sacrifice to us. We don't, we don't earn God's approval, but Jesus gives it to us. He gives us a new life that can please him. But we also, we cooperate with the Spirit. We need to seek to live in that approval and not commit evil sins. As we listen to God's word, we'll find that we, too, delight in God's law. We delight, we get new life from reading it. We see that he redeems us through it, and he will restrain us from sin. We're going to take a minute, we're going to sing an old revival song. Just part of this repentance response to God's word. It's, it's called, Cleanse Me, O God.